So hello, everybody. Uh, it's exciting to be here. I'm Yasmin Ergas. I direct the specialization in gender and public policy here at SIPA, and I'm a senior lecturer at SIPA. I want to thank, first of all, Dean Yarhi Milo, Secretary Clinton, for your leadership of this women's initiative and for your vision in knowing that it's an essential component of what the IGP is going to do. And to Christina Shelby and Lauren Hoffman and the whole team that has made this day a possibility. I also want to thank all the students in the room, the IGP scholars and the GPPSers who are here, that is the specializers in gender and public policy, for whom 2023-2024 uh, marks our 10th anniversary, and that is and will be a cause for celebration in itself. But this launch is for me, and I know for us all, a celebration of the schools and of the IGP's deep commitment, as we've heard, to gender equality and of our collective recognition that equality does not come simply because we wish it or because we know it is right or even because we know it is our right. It comes, as we have heard, it will come, when we have mobilized all our capacities and equalities, and equality has become the norm rather than the exception, or to put it slightly differently and echoing what has been said, when once and for all, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights, and that means that we will have gotten into the weeds of public policy as we just heard. When she was still just a lawyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg addressed her future colleagues at, on the Supreme Court, quoting a abolitionist of a century ago, two centuries ago, saying, I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Our panelists are extraordinary alumni have asked for no favors as they have worked to remove those feet often of lead off all of our necks. And for that, I'm sure we are all grateful. Commitment to public service is, as Tocqueville said, a habit of the heart. Its successful pursuit is a matter of skill, resolve, vision, and of course, daring. I like to think that SIPA breeds those qualities and that the Women's Initiative will help them to flourish. In a minute, I will turn the mic over to our own fearless secretary, Hillary Rodham Clinton, who has paved the way in so many ways. But first, I'd like to briefly introduce our fearless alumni, Mayor Claudia Lopez, Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, and Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. Mayor Claudia Lopez, became Bogota's first female and first lesbian mayor in the, in the city's history in 2019. She emphasizes environmental, education, social equity, and anti-corruption agendas, and was a senator of the Republic of Colombia between 2014 and 2018, and vice presidential candidate in the 2018 presidential election for the Green Alliance Party. I'm going to skip over very distinguished biographies here, just to mention that currently she is an advanced leadership fellow at Harvard University. I'm going to introduce everybody all at once. And New York City Fire Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh oversees the day-to-day -day administration of the agency's 17,000 employees and wields a $2 billion budget. She has been a key leader in the agency's response to major incidents, including the Ebola outbreak of 2015 and the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, which as you all know, would try any ad administrator or political leader beyond anyone's capacities, which she has handled. Commissioner Kavanaugh directed the firefighter recruitment campaign to yield the most diverse applicant pool in department history. And Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs of California's 51st Congre Congressional District is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where she also serves as ranking member of the Subcommittee on Africa. She is also a member of the, House's, of the House Armed Services Committee and sits on the committee's Quality of Life panel. She is the youngest member of the Democratic House leadership. 
She serves as co-chair of the Protection of Civilians in Conflict Caucus, vice chair of the New Democrats Coalition on Artificial Intelligence Working Group, and vice chair of the Congressional Equality Caucus, where she is, where she is the co-chair of the Transgender Equality Task Force. I could go into much greater depth in all of these very distinguished biographies. I want to emphasize one point. They are our alumni. And this is what SIPA, I think, teaches, leads to, which is to being a leader. So thank you all very much, and may I invite Secretary Clinton to the podium. Thank you so much, Esmond, for that introduction and for helping to uh, teach and nurture uh, students uh, who become leaders here at SIPO over so many years. Um, this is exciting for me because we have uh, three extraordinary alums who happen to be women leaders in quite a variety of roles. And each of them is a trailblazer and a glass breaker. Uh, and I want to start, if I could, uh, in asking what your experience here at SEPA uh, contributed to your career choices, to the uh, way that you lead and manage now, and any other lessons that you might have uh, taken from that. Let me start with you, Commissioner. Sure. Um, I, I should preface this by saying I was a uh, first deputy commissioner when I came back to SEPA, so I graduated only a couple years ago. Uh, I did it on the weekends and at night, and I did that because at the time I was in a role that was sort of like the chief operating officer, and when I got to the fire department, I really don't think I knew what I was getting into trying to enact gender <laughs> equality, frankly. I knew it would be hard. Uh, the fire workforce, for, for context, is 99% male, and that is an increase since I started there. <laughs> um, so when I say male-dominated, you know, I really, uh, we really mean that at the fire department, and I really thought, I need help. You know, I cannot do this alone. It is far bigger than I ever realized. And so I came here looking for that help. And I think what SIBA did for me was help me understand a lot of what you already heard up here, the structures of power, how much of it was about economics, how much of it was about the, the stories we tell about women and the way women are perceived as leaders and frankly, the treatment of women online, which you've already mentioned. Actually, Nina, who I think is speaking later, was part of one of my papers that I wrote. Just that helping me to understand not only to tackle this problem, do I need all this support and really need to change the structures of power, not just get a few great women there, um, but also frankly, the way I was treated and the way I was felt was normal. It wasn't just me, I wasn't just doing something not quite right. This was the experience of being a woman in a place like that. And it made me, gave me some solace every day when I got to work. I think that's really important. And I hope that we transcribe that and pass it out to students because you said two things. I mean, understanding the structure of power and how things work and how you can intervene and impact how things work, but also that you're not alone. I mean, leadership at the levels that these three women find themselves can be a very lonely experience. And uh, I think uh, there's a great book that Claire Shipman and her co-author wrote about uh, women's power that goes chapter and verse about how difficult that is. So those are two really uh, important points, Laura. Mayor, how about for you? What was your uh, SEPA experience like in terms of your political career and your uh, continued uh, uh, growth in uh, leadership and impact? Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always glad to be back home. Uh, well, I came here when I was 30 years old and now 53. Uh, I have to say the first year was very tough because I came in January that year <laughs> to, start, to, start, to start studying in English first. Uh, I never studied in a bilingual uh, school uh, back home in Bogota, Colombia. So I had to study English first. Then I was fortunate enough to get the, the scholarship, the IDB scholarship, and I was successfully admitted to SIPA. When, when I came to this room for my introduction week, I was so excited that I was into my first class. 
and I went out of the first class, and I said, I'm not going to make it in. I mean, this is a statistic class. I hardly ever understand statistics in Spanish, <laughs> even less in English. I didn't got 80% of the class. I know it was a statistic because my sort of the paper that they gave me was a statistics about the first class. <laughs> so it was tough. The first year was very challenging, getting used to a new world, a new city, a very diverse. I mean, the most diverse that I ever ex was exposed in my life was like maybe a couple of friends in my high school who were afro descendant That's pretty much all the diversity that I was exposed to. So being here really exposed to people from all over the world, all over, you know, different continents, countries, backgrounds, languages. So yes, the school was amazing, but the interaction with all the people outside classes, the networking, the level, the conversations, the meetings, the food you can share, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing, it's a great experience. So that level of diversity was incredibly help. And the third thing is sort of the first, outside my mom's, which is believes that I'm like superwoman forever, and that has been incredibly a definite, you know, uh, attribute that helped me throughout life. You know, that really she said, you can achieve whatever you want to. <laughs> but when I came here, it was like, you know, I was like, well, I'm 30 years old. I'm coming from being sort of a local mayor in Bogota. So as much as New York is divided in five boroughs, Bogota is divided in 20 localities. I was the local mayor of one of those localities. And when I said that here, I said, well, I don't know, you know, how can I move forward? Uh, which sort of professional career to take? Um, said, I remember a professor who told me, look, you're at New York, you're at Columbia, you're at SIPA, you have that experience, you're gonna achieve whatever you want to. You just have to believe it, period, you know? Look at you, a year ago, you barely couldn't speak English, and you're a, a year, to be graduated from SIPA. So make the most of it. Stop suffering, you know, enjoy it. Really enjoy it. Take the time and enjoy it because it's gonna be the two years of your life that are gonna be a breaking point for your life. And it, that was exactly what it was. Uh, and I have then all these tools and connections and networks, but also this leadership, you know, these leadership skills. To, to exercise what leadership is, which is assuming responsibility, doing your own part to empower others to achieve something meaningful for you, for your country, and for your society. And that's what I've been doing since then. I'm kind of be more proud of my school. Oh, something else we need to transcribe. I love that. <laughs> and I, I love that um, a professor here told you to believe in yourself, so it wasn't just your mother. Um, <laughs> And that's an important message uh, that we all need to hear from time to time. Yeah. And uh, the fact that you, you know, got these leadership skills, these networks, that's part of what we hope the SEPA experience uh, provides. Thank you so much. Congresswoman, so um, you are uh, someone who came to SEPA at a younger age mm -hmm. uh, and before you started your political uh, career. So maybe you have a slightly different perspective about what SEPA uh, meant for you. Yeah, so I did the five-year program. So I started at Columbia College and then came to SEPA um, straight from there. Uh, and so it was really at the beginning of my career. I'd done a couple of internships. I sort of had a sense of what I wanted to work on, but it was really here at SEPA that I sort of delved really deeply into international conflict resolution and decided that that was going to be my career. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, wait a second, you're not in international conflict resolution right now. And you would be correct. Um, uh, but, well, some uh, of us who look at the Congress wonder. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's my conflict resolution good skills. Training ground. Yes, my conflict resolution skills definitely come in handy. Um, uh, but for the first part of my career, that's what I did. I worked at the State Department. I worked at the UN. I worked at UNICEF. I see Henrietta here. Um, and uh, it was amazing. And I felt like every day I was using what I learned at SEPA. Uh, and then Donald Trump got elected, and I had to figure out what I wanted to do next after working uh, on your campaign. Uh, and I realized that everything I cared about was happening at home. So I moved back home. Uh, I ran for Congress. I was 28 at the time. Uh, and actually having that SEPA degree was incredibly important because uh, many of you know that young women are often questioned about their qualifications way more than young men are. Uh, and I was constantly asked, 
are you sure? Um, why aren't you running for school board? Why are you running for Congress? School board's very important, but uh, my background was in foreign policy, so it didn't really make sense to work on the school board for me. Um, and being able to say, no, actually, I went to I went to SEPA. I have a master's degree in these issues. No, actually, the talking points you're hearing the other candidates use are some I helped write for Secretary Clinton when she was running for president. Like, I am qualified. Um, it was incredibly important. And now, while I'm in Congress, um, I find there are two sets of problems, right? There's the problems we actually all know the answer to, we just don't have the political will to do them. And those are incredibly frustrating. But we also have these challenges that even if we wanna solve them, we don't know how. We don't have all the answers. And I am constantly leaning on the theories and the research and the way I was taught to think about problems from my time here at SEPA in dealing with that second basket of challenges and trying to figure out actually what is the best way forward. Okay, transcribe that too. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I think this ought to go into all of the uh, recruitment uh, materials um, because honestly, uh, Hearing from these three leaders uh, just reminds me of how important it is that we keep the connection between what people are doing uh, out in the so-called real world and what we do here at SEPA and Columbia and make sure that we make that connection as strong and uh, fluid as we possibly can. Um, Sarah, uh, you're the youngest member of the Democratic House leadership, and as you said, you had a lot of experience in a number of uh, areas uh, uh, concerning foreign uh, policy uh, issues. And you've been an unwavering advocate for women's rights in Congress, from reproductive rights to contraception to child care. And you also have uh, a very interesting uh, bipartisan uh, effort to try to make it possible for uh, women in Congress um, who have given birth to be able to keep voting before they return. So these have been issues that are really what we think of as very important women's issues, but they're also um, part of the whole political landscape that we are inhabiting right now and uh, represent some of the uh, challenges that we see coming from uh, people on the other side. Could you talk about your work on these issues in Congress? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Congress is uh, an institu institution that's designed by and for old white men. Um, it's a little bit less like that than when you were there, but not as much as we would want. Um, and you can see that in how the institution is designed, and you can see that in what's prioritized. I mean, you heard Secretary Raimondo talk about the comments she re she received from even Democratic senators. Um, I received the exact same comments when we were trying to push for child care in Build Back Better. Oh, that's a woman's issue. Oh, well, I don't understand why they don't just have an aunt down the street who can help take care of the kids. I'm like, that's just not how it works anymore. Um, the aunt's probably still working. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's really important that we have more women, and in particular more young women, at the table because the issues that we're facing are different and that matters in the big fights we're having right now around reproductive health care. And it also matters in the areas that we can find uh, common ground, actually, uh, and actually get things done. Um, so, you know, uh, in my first term in Congress, the Dobbs decision came down. Uh, which took away the right to abortion uh, for people across this country. And I remember getting phone calls, texts from, from all my, from my friends, from my peers, asking about their period tracking apps. There was a big movement on TikTok around period tracking apps to delete your app. Uh, and I started talking to some of my colleagues about it. And f first of all, I had to explain to many of my male colleagues, even Democrats, that yes, people track their periods. And yes, there are apps that help you do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and that this post-Roe era is gonna look a lot different than the pre-Roe era because we now have this digital surveillance system in place that people, that we are seeing states use to target people who are seeking abortions and those trying to help them. And we're already seeing that data being used. We're seeing private Facebook messages being used. If you present to a hospital with a miscarriage, oftentimes the only evidence they'll have that you try to use uh, that you sought an abortion rather than, you know, a, a natural miscarriage. It's whether or not you bought uh, abortion medication online or Google searched uh, about how to get an abortion or visited the location of an abortion clinic, right? This is the evidence they have in prosecutions. Um, and so I, I took my experience as a young woman who used a period tracking app and being a digital native, 
and I introduced legislation to protect all reproductive and sexual health data. Um, and you know, I think it's incredibly important. Two thirds of Americans think it's incredibly important, including 54% of Republicans who believe that Congress should act to protect reproductive health data. And I can tell you for certain, this is not something that would have happened if there weren't young women in Congress, because it was not something that my colleagues were thinking about. It just wasn't part of their everyday life. Um, and it's the same thing on, on childcare. You know, I'm a 35 year old woman, so basically all I talk about with my friends is like who's having a baby, who wants to have a baby, who doesn't want to have a baby, and then how they're gonna afford that baby once it gets here. Um, and I can't tell you how many of my friends are have been pushed out of the workforce because they can't find childcare, or if they find childcare, it's more expensive than the money they'd be making in the job, and it's just not worth it for their family. Um, but when you talk to my colleagues about this, even good Democratic male older colleagues, they don't see this economic issue. Uh, and Secretary Raimondo talked about it as being a, a, a good investment. It's true. All of these people who are fixated on fiscal concerns, well, you actually save $6 for every $1 you invest in quality early childhood programs. So if, if you actually want to talk about good fiscal responsibility, this to me is a no brainer. Um, but but a lot of my colleagues don't understand that, and it's not. And a lot of times, it's because it's it's not their lived experience. But it's actually been an area that we've been able to find common ground across the aisle. So, you know, my philosophy of bipartisanship is how do we think about the big things we're trying to do, and then find where we can agree, versus how do we get to some watered down least common denominator. Uh, and so. I had some very odd allies in this. So Anna Paulina Luna and I, for instance, a Republican from Florida who introduced the censure of Adam Schiff, uh, her and I are working together to get proxy voting for members of Congress who give birth. Um, believe it or not, uh, despite the fact that on, on many things I disagree with him, and, and I think in, in many ways uh, we, we might not see him in Congress that much longer. Uh, Matt Gates and I work together to get fertility access for service members. Um, I work with Jennifer Kiggins of Virginia on uh, child care and housing for service members. I work with Stephanie Bice on parental leave. Like, these are issues that we're able to work with because we're younger and we're facing these issues ourselves, um, even if we don't come at it at the exact same way. Um, and I think that we're gonna see more and more of that the more we get young people and women into positions of power. Absolutely, that's a great summary of what's possible. And so, Claudia, you were Bogota's first female and first openly gay mayor, and you prioritized the care economy, something we've been talking about. Uh, can you tell us more about the care blocks in Bogota? How could they be models for other cities around the world? I mean, this is another area we really want to dive into uh, with the Women's Initiative at IGP. What is working elsewhere that we could actually study and learn from and maybe bring back? And uh, you've got a great example. Thank you so much. Well, I want to pick up the point of our brave representative here that when we are in positions of influence, let's call it that, could be power or not, but influence, we can bring issues that otherwise wouldn't be on the table. So, um, I'm the first mayor of Bogota, first openly gay and woman of Bogota. So it was my mandate to do something literally meaningful. It was not about simply improving things that were already there, improving some services, but what is really not being done, even though Bogota has had, I have to say, very progressive men mayors, but none of them think about the fact that we are an eight million people city in a 10 million people metropolitan area. It's a very large city. It's very diverse, it's fantastic. 52% of the population, a little bit more than four million inhabitants are women. 25% of them, 1,100,000 are caregivers, unpaid caregivers, meaning Probably women whose average profile could be 40 or 50 years old, that barely finished high school, if finished, that sacrifice any post-secondary education opportunity they have to take care of members of their family. And I'm coming from a country in which, in Bogotá, 32% of the economy is informal. In the country, 60% of the economy is informal. And what informality means? It means you don't have 
a minimum salary, neither of $5 or $15. You simply don't have a minimum salary whatsoever. You don't have health insurance. You don't have a pension fund. But at some point, we are all kids and need care. We will be elders, and we will need care. At some point, we may get sick, and we will need care. If you don't have a minimum salary, a pension fund, and a health insurance, who provides that care? Woman. Unpaid care work done by woman is the actual social security of half of our society in Latin America, because this could be the same story in Brazil or in Peru or in Chile. You know. uh, and that's simply that this is absolutely unfair. The level of overburden, of exclusion, of injustice that is uh, taken upon women is simply unbearable for them. But it is, as the former secretary was saying here, is not only unfair with them, is unproductive for us as a society. Keeping half of the population out of the labor force, out of the innovation, out of the tax base, uh, economy, that's simply uh, absurd. But because many women Congress members, like back in roughly 15 years ago, led by Cecilia Lopez, a former senator from the Liberal Party in my country, and they unite forces in the, they create, first of all, the Women Caucus in Congress from all the parties. And they started with this issue of the care economy. And they approve a law by which the Colombian government, national government, has to measure, has to measure every year how much of the economy is the unpaid care work that women does. So we know now for sure that the largest economic sector in Colombia's economy is the economy of care, which accounts for 21% of Colombia's GDP. We know for sure that the economy of care accounts for 13 percent of Bogota's GDP. So what we did in the care blocks is I said, well, guess what? I'm going to be mayor. I'm not president yet. <laughs> so I cannot set up a social security system or do that change at the national level where it could be done. That's, for example, when Uruguay, which is the best example of a care economy and, and a care system, was done in Uruguay at the national level as a national policy. So I'm just going to be mayor. What can I do? I'm in charge of all the social services of the city. I deal with the COVID-19 pandemic because I am the health authority of the city. I deal with, with kids at school every day because I am the education authority at the high school level in the city. So what I do have is social infrastructure spread all around the city, especially in the poorest neighborhoods of the cities are the, where the best social infrastructure is located. That infrastructure is underused. There is clothes from five on. There is clothes in, weekday, in weekends. What if we can open, break the silos? These belong to the health secretary. These belong to the education secretary. Now, these belong to the city and to the women, regardless of where they are. And add services that can relieve women from eight, eight hours a week or more of unpaid care work. So to be able to do that, you have to reuse all this infrastructure to provide three kinds of services. First of all, to provide services for care receivers. Because you can offer that woman, Maria Esperanza, 45 years old, you can offer her a scholarship in SIPA. If you don't take care of their family members that they love, they won't care. They won't take it. So we care for them. And in the same infrastructure, we offer opportunities for the free time we're offering to that woman. Free laundry services, free education services, free training, free opportunities to be involved in a new job, maybe in a new business. All those services exclusively for women to relieve them from the overburden are offered in the care blocks. And the third service we realize, talking to this woman, that we have to offer is cultural transformation. Because this is not only a structural economic problem, a structural social problem, it's a structural cultural problem. It's because of machism. It's because of patriarchalism that we are granted these roles and having this conversation that we still have to have. So we call the 
male members of their families, and we invite them to the care blocks and said, men of this world, you're welcome to learn to care. You can learn. This is not something that we have in the DNA. We just learn it. You know, if you don't know how to do the laundry of your home, we can teach you. <laughs> you don't know how to cook, guess what? We can teach you. <laughs> you don't know how to, you know, be with your kids, take them to the school, do homework with them, we can teach you. We all can learn to care, and we de if we redistribute this work among us, we will not only be helping women, reducing their poverty, empowering their opportunities, having a more inclusive democracy and more inclusive economy, but also you will be happier. The seven, the level of empathy, solidarity, care for others that we, we as women are empowered with, guess what, you know, that's a bliss. That's a bliss that can come to you if you learn. So those are the care blocks. They didn't exist in 2020. By the end of 2023, after my four year term, we have 23 care blocks. We serve half a million women and members of their families, and we were awarded uh, the prize as the best worldwide city's social innovation of the world. Congratulations, Claudia. Wow. And, and finally, you know, Laura, you're the 34th fire commissioner of the uh, fire department, first woman to hold this position. I admire you so much. <laughs> yeah. and, I really appreciate everything you've done. You oversee the nation's largest fire department. Um, and look, as you said, firefighting's a male-dominated industry. Um, and we know that there are lots of challenges to getting women into such industries. So how have you tried to make gender equality at FDNY a priority? And what more do you think could be done? And how could um, the initiative, your uh, your colleagues, your admirers here at SEPA uh, and IGP help you uh, with those kinds of uh, goals? Well, I appreciate an ask, so I'm going to have a list probably after this. I definitely <laughs> need the help. Um, I, I'd say a couple of things about what we've done there. I think what you've heard from a lot of these panelists is thinking about the structure. So everything I've heard up here from whether or not the equipment fits women, we also have had to fight to put female bathrooms in firehouses. You know, there's really just a question of infrastructure, like go to a women be a firefighter and be welcome there. Uh, and that's a lot of what I've done and I think is a, a battle we have to continue to fight. Um, same thing with the economics. And I think that's not only starting to reframe some of this as economic. I think Stacey Abrams mentioned it. When you talk about DNI, unfortunately, you lose a whole bunch of people. When you say it's about economics, you know, do we want to preserve good union jobs, which firefighting jobs are? Yes. Do we want 50% of the population to have access to those jobs? Yes. Uh, and I think that's really critical, including including, frankly, fighting for the women-dominated jobs that are underpaid. Uh, so an example, in the fire department, we serve side-by-side -side with EMS. They are significantly more diverse. 30% of their workforce is women. They make significantly less money. Uh, and one of the things I've done is try to fight for equal pay for them, and we are getting there, but they're nowhere near that. So making sure those two sides of the equation are there. And then the last thing, and I think this is really where a place like SEPA and the Institute can help, is it is so meaningful who we imagine in these jobs. And I, I cannot emphasize that enough. And I'll give some examples. Everything from, uh, you know, the firefighter in the field. We did a bunch of research when we were doing our recruitment campaign that was mentioned at the outset. And what we found in the focus groups, it was not that there were not women qualified for these jobs. They are very hard physical jobs, yes. But there are men who can't do it, and there are lots of women who can. But what we found was the difference between the men and the women is the women assumed they weren't welcome. They assumed they couldn't meet the standards, even when they often you know, were well above the standard, and they assumed they wouldn't be welcome in the firehouse. And so really beginning to reframe who is in these jobs, I think, is so, so important, which also means talking about what is the job. You know, we do run through walls with big men with axes. That is a part of the job. But frankly, a lot of what firefighting is in the 21st century is a high stakes critical thinking job. And if you talk to any captain on this job, they will talk about how they need a smaller guy to go into a confined space. They need a mathematically proficient guy to make sure that the pressure is OK with the water outside. And they need a, a bigger guy to run through that wall. And when you start to talk about that equation, you want women 
in, in high stakes critical thinking jobs. I think we'd all agree on that. <laughs> and they're an important piece of that puzzle. You know, the diversity that everybody brings to the fire ground is critical to their safety and a bunch of research backs that up. So beginning to show women that they're welcome there. And then I think finally in leadership, you know, the reality is if I asked somebody to imagine a fire commissioner, including myself, I don't think I'd imagine me. You know, you still imagine a large man, right? And I would actually say when I am at events, 99% of the time, I am assumed to be the wife of the chiefs I am standing next to. Um, tells you a lot about what leadership still is for women uh, and how much we need to change that. So I think about that a lot. Sometimes I get it right, sometimes I don't get it right. I also just think it is such a journey for all of us to talk about power and to talk about authority and leadership, and especially when those jobs are particularly male archetyped, which a lot of political jobs also are. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important that we can start to not only show different people in that job, but also to really break down leadership and talk about you know, why is being soft-spoken okay if you also are really diplomatic and that's what's needed, right? Um, that it's not always just about you know, a loud voice in a room. So I think that's where we can partner. Oh, wow. This has been absolutely amazing. Please thank the commissioner, the mayor, and the congresswoman for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.